science knowledge only adds to the excitement, the mystery, and the awe of a flower. Evidence is evidence. It's public. Everybody can look at the evidence and assess it, and eventually, if there's enough evidence, come to the same conclusion. For newcomers and old timers alike, the Chloe Sanctuary hopes to give you insight into the health and happiness of your companion parrots. We hope to help you build happy homes using reliable and proven tools. The best homes are built on a rock solid foundation. And the best foundation for a happy home is the bedrock of science. When we stand on the shoulders of giants, the scientists who have worked long and diligently to understand our companions, we can reach new heights of understanding. And understanding is the key to success. What does avian veterinary medicine have to tell us about our feathered friends? How can we prevent illness, see the signs of disease before it's too late, and care for our birds through ill health? What light does behavioral science shed on their nature, needs, and hopes? How can the tools of behavior shaping make our homes happier for us and our companions? How can we deal with biting, screaming, or other misbehavior? What is it like to live among parrots, let them roam around about you and share a life with them? How much freedom do you give them? What happens if you form a bond of trust with them? Watch and see what understanding their true nature can do for you. Come with us on a journey as we do more than examine a parrot's world. We live in it. Make some popcorn and bring in a few wood blocks. Let everyone have something to chew and a comfortable place to perch. Cockatoot is a presentation of the Chloe Sanctuary for Parrots and Cockatoos, a nonprofit charity dedicated to the empowerment of captive parrots and public awareness. Cockatoos with attitude. Cockatoot. Hi, and welcome to Cockatude, Cockatoos with Attitude, episode 31. So you want to rescue parrots? Well, back in 2007, I got a wild hair and thought, there isn't a parrot rescue anywhere in northern San Diego County. I think I'll start one. So I did a bunch of research, and I started one, and obviously I've been taking care of birds for quite some time now, and we're still here, so I thought perhaps we had some ideas that we might be able to impart to those who are interested in, in doing what we're doing, or something similar. And also, there's a lot of little tips and tricks that everybody can use in this episode. It's not just for people who want to start to rescue. Um, <clears throat> little things about like, uh, how to get the best prices on toys, how to get yeah, the best way to clean things up. Um, fastest and best way, uh, in this society, everyone likes the idea of quick, easy, and cheap. Well, in the world of parrot rescue, you need to figure out ways, at least... Hi, Chad. Oh, you want to sing? Do you have a second verse to that song? You got a second verse, Peaches? No, not today. Oh, that was a beautiful song, though. Yes, it was. At least as far as cleaning supplies and, and incidentals and food and all that kind of thing. So well, we're going to try to impart some of those ideas. By no means is this going to be complete. But we can point to a lot of things that we had to find the hard way that will help both people who have a, a parrot or two in their home and those who wish to actually start a parrot rescue or sanctuary.
And we'll go over the, the differences between the two. You can have a rescue, you can have a rescue, you can have a sanctuary, or you could have a rescue and sanctuary. So rescues, you know, they, they, they adopt out birds. Uh, they bring them in, they fix them up, they adopt them out, that's the idea. Um, sanctuaries usually take in birds that are really damaged and keep them until they die. That's the idea of a sanctuary. If you're a rescue and sanctuary, you do both. So, and it's funny because when I originally started the Chloe Sanctuary, I chose the name because I liked the people at the Lily Sanctuary up in Los Angeles. They were great people. And uh, they gave me some good advice that I didn't take from the beginning. But um, so they had the Lily Sanctuary, and I thought, well, the Chloe Sanctuary, because Chloe is such a magnificent bird. It's a good time to introduce our birds. Chloe's sitting right here. Hi, Chloe. She's recently divorced. Um, doesn't happen much in their world, but she's recently divorced. And I have Roman here, vicious, old, oh, terrible. Roman, yes, you are. Or such a mean bird. Well, that's what we were told anyway, but he's not mean at all, is he? No, no, he's a lover, not a fighter, right, Roman bird? Yes, he's a good boy. Yes, you are. Yes, he'll fight for his love. Babalu. Uh, should, I should tell you a little bit of each of their problems. She, uh, Chloe had extreme feather destructive behavior. We have pictures of that online. Uh, didn't have much on her chest. Was tearing into her, her feathers on her wings and all that kind of thing. Roman was scared to death and chewing on his feathers when he came here. He was just a frightened to be alive. Right, Roman? Right, Roman? Yeah, had a reputation as a biter. This one down here had a reputation as a biter and a screamer. Screaming all day long, but what's 125 decibels between friends every two seconds, you know? Maybe a second and a half. Hello. Nice long tongue there you got, kid. So, that's Salamander up there, the one who stuck his tongue out and got my attention. And this is Peaches. She never wants anybody to pay any attention to her. And Sugar's up there on the high perch. And that's Lorelei over there. Um, I've now determined that Cecil has a problem with the cameras because I brought him in here and he immediately started getting nippy, which is bizarre because he plays in here every night with the movies on, with the, could also be the lighting. We have the bright lights for the videos, where normally we have dim lighting, but uh, I couldn't get him to stay in the room. He was just nipping at everything and, uh, and everybody, so um, <clears throat> we'll work on it. That all started when his mate left, so that's probably the the key that kind of set him off but he's fine every other time and maybe I'll put a snip of what he's like in here um, later tonight when I have him out so you kind of see what his normal behavior is you're not going after the heater salamander leave the heater alone we don't want you doing it Sal so <clears throat> so I'll keep an eye on you and if I have to put I what I do is I take that plastic chair there and I turn it upside down and put it on top of that cage and then he won't get anywhere near that but I try not to do it unless he just refuses to, to stop trying to go for the, the heater and he takes all my attention that's it we're going to put the chair up there excuse me everybody so there's ways you can deal with situations and one way is just to put something else, scoot, scoot, scoot out of the way. There you go. He doesn't like the chair up there. So if you put the chair up there, he won't pop it and go after the heater. I don't want to put it up there because I'm trying to encourage him to come over. And generally I can just coax him over. But he knows my attention is focused over here so he can sneak. Um... Yeah, they're smart enough to realize these things. So the chair is up there just to keep him from going for the heater. There's only a small section that he might be able to get to the wires on. And I don't think he can mess with the buttons because they're those kind of buttons that lay fairly flat on the surface of the outside of it. But it's also, you know, it's hot on the bottom. It's a radiator type, so it's not that hot on the top. But if you got too close to the bottom, he might bring himself and we don't want that. Do we? Now. So let's get to the, the meat of the stuff. We're going to cover 
Um, what it takes to start up the sanctuary, and and looking at how how you go about that. Um, financially, uh, what you need to know about birds in order to do it, what kind of backing and support you need. So. We hope you will consider supporting us on Patreon today. This is how it works. We produce up to two videos a month. As a patron, you pledge to give us a donation. Whatever you feel is right and meets your budget. Patreon gives us your gift monthly. You can easily set a limit on how much you donate a month. You can change the amount of your pledge at any time. Your gift will allow us to continue bringing you entertaining and informative videos. Patreon.com forward slash Chloe Sanctuary. We look forward to your participation in Cockatude. Well, the first thing you need to do is you need to go and take a course. Uh, you can do this through SCORE, uh, which is an association. It's S-C-O-R-E. It's an association of retired professionals, and they generally have classes on how to start nonprofits and how to start businesses. And they're business professionals that are retired, and they can tell you how to do things. And um, I remember when I went down to SCORE, and I was going to start getting ready to start the sanctuary, and they said, and this is something you need to remember, get as many credit cards as you possibly can and build up your credit line through multiple different credit line sources because every, every business that's a startup needs a big, needs a well of credit to draw from if things happen. And generally, things happen. Um, I also had that advice, which it stuck, so I had that advice from Fran Cannon Training. Fran had told me that the one thing that could really save your life would be having credit cards if you needed them. So you could go out and, you know, they don't like you to just have a credit card and don't use it, so you can go out and buy your groceries with one and pay for your gasoline with another. Just pay them off every month so you don't get the credit charges. So you want that line of credit, okay. And you're also gonna, you never know. I mean, with with Peaches, I mean, I had to put it on the credit card. We didn't have the money in the sanctuary uh, when she had her impacted feathers in the back. So I put her, her medical on the credit card. There's a thousand dollars for two surgeries to, to fix her up and then medicine. So you need that credit line because you get a bird in um, and all of a sudden you realize you have a medical issue because um, it's $300 to bring them in anyway. Um, you've got to get the DNA testing done so you know if they have psittacosis or whatever. So it's a, um, we'll get into that part of it later, but you need to find out what's involved in running one of these and how to start a nonprofit. Um, so do that first. And if you don't think you have the time to do that, then you probably shouldn't start a rescue. And the reason I say that is that if you don't get a grounding in business and understand what you're doing, come on up, sweetheart. You wanna come up? You can come up if you want to. Oh, there you are, boy. There's the salamander. The salamander bird. He likes the cameras. He likes to be involved in this, don't you? You like it when I'm sitting here talking. Bob, that's not nice. So, so get a grounding on what it takes to start a business. 
and you're going to have to understand something about the counting and counting methods and and uh, what it takes to to, uh, to file with the IRS. And there's a book too that you need, which is by Nolo Press. It's called How to Start a Nonprofit. Imagine that. And there's a different one for California. They have their own special things you have to do. In California, you have to file with the uh, the tax board and with the IRS. Um, but that will tell you how to go through that process. Now, here's a key. I learned this from SCORE, but it's a key. You need to fill out the paperwork yourself. Now, if it's a husband-wife team or you know a couple of partners that are working this out, you need to fill out the paperwork together and you need to go through the book together. Not hand it off to someone else. And I've told a lot of people who are starting nonprofits to do this and they hand it off to someone else because they're too busy. You're going to forget things or you're going to do something wrong. Say example, uh, there's something that's going to be on the ballot coming up and we're going to get behind that. So on your website you put up there that you're against this this bill that's being you know pushed through the city to do XXX that has to do with pets. Now you're in violation of the 501c3 code. Uh, you're not allowed to be involved in, in politics. You didn't do the paperwork, so you don't know that, so you stick your nose in there. There's papers that have to be filed with the IRS in the state every year. And you got the, like, in, in California, it may be different in your state, but in California, you have to file something with the, the Secretary of State. It's who's, who your uh, board of directors are. Um, you have to list the one that is the uh, chief financial officer, the secretary, and then whoever's in charge, which would be the executive director. And then so you have to have at least three people on the board and then an executive director. So those are requirements you have to fulfill. If you had somebody else do it, you don't know what the requirements are. You're just listening to other people. You're probably not going to make it. You're going to make a mistake somewhere along the line. You're not going to file the paperwork with the state or um, the, the Board of Equalization, or you're not going to file the paperwork with the uh, Secretary of State or the IRS. And then they may just you know, cancel your nonprofit status. And that may happen towards the end of the year, and you've been getting all these donations, and now all of a sudden you have to pay taxes on those. So um, you need to file the paperwork yourself. Now, the other thing is, don't get paranoid. Um, this isn't, it isn't rocket science as far as filing the, the paperwork. And the book will walk you through the process. There's things you have to do that you don't realize, right, Salamander? There's things that you're not going to have sex with my hand. It's not going to happen. I'll pet you, though, okay? Yeah, I know that look. I know that look, little boy. So, it's, like I say, it's not rocket science, science to, to do this stuff. It's going to say, well, you need to submit uh, flyers and business cards and, you know, what's, what's your website? So, you're, that, it'll help you through the process. Like, website. What's my, well, we don't have a website. So, you set up a website. And you got to have business cards. So, you print those up. And then you got to have flyers and uh, brochures. So, you make those up. So... As you're working through this process, it'll help you with the things you need. I mean, obviously, you're going to need flyers. You're going to need brochures, business cards. You're going to need those things. You're going to need a website. So, um, and it's not that hard. I mean, you could set up a website fairly cheap um, through WordPress.com. You can set one up for free. Um, get a little bit of help from someone on setting it up. It isn't that tough to do. Um, and then the printing stuff, you can use uh, there's tons of software out there for creating flyers. They don't have to be that great. You just want to basically say what you're, what you're about and why you're doing what you're doing. And uh, that's not that tough. But um, so you work through the book, you have to create bylaws, you're going to need a board of directors, and I'll put links to this kind of information in the show notes so that you can refer to these when you get ready to do this and won't have to hunt them down like I had to do. Hello. 
If you are enjoying our videos, we hope that you can find it in your heart to support our work. It costs between $25,000 to $30,000 a year to care for our flock of heartbroken and abused birds. Most of our birds came with feather destructive disorder. Even a basic exam with blood work costs $300. Medical emergencies cost us thousands a year. We are a nonprofit and donations are tax deductible to the full extent of the law. We need your support. Birds deserve a happy and healthy life. Become our patron at www.patreon.com slash Chloe Sanctuary to support us on a per video basis or donate at our webpage today. Okay, so um, you can get some friends to be on the board to start. You know, later on you're going to want people who are, you know, can help you with some financial backing if possible and also with spreading the word. That's always great to have. But at, far, at first you can start off with friends. Obviously, whoever is the chief financial officer is going to have to look over the books. So you want them to at least know how to read books. But So... Go to SCORE, learn how to start a not what they what they say about starting a nonprofit, um, and see if it's if that's right for you. Take the class, see if you're gonna you feel comfortable with doing this, and then once you've done that, so you have an idea of where you're going, uh, make sure that you know what you need to know about birds. And here's something else too. If you're starting out with, you got a, a partner, you know, your life partner has, they've got some of the knowledge that you need to run this and you don't feel that you do, you need to know it too. Because if your life partner gets sick and you have to do the books, but you don't know how to run QuickBooks, now you got a problem. So you both should have at least enough working knowledge to do what the other does. And you might need that to start but you want to have that down as soon as you can so then you want to go out and you can go out to the uh, American Fe Federation of Aviculturalists I uh, I obviously don't believe in raising birds um, to sell but because I, I you know I have to deal with all the the fallout from that on a regular basis are you gonna scream the whole time why don't you just come over here and see me come over and see me and then you won't scream the whole time. Because you just want to sit on my lap anyway, right? Yeah, I kind of thought so. I kind of thought so. Yeah, that's what you like. So, they do have a couple of classes on biology and physiology uh, of birds, and you need that. And then if you go out to behaviorworks.org, you can sign up to take their... Uh, Dr. Friedman's free class in learning, uh, learning and living with parrots. It's um, a class in applied behavior analysis, so you know how to work with these birds, you understand behavior. Okay. It takes a while to get into that class, so you probably want to sign up for that as soon as possible. And you can go out to Yahoo to uh, the Parrot VAS group and sign up to start learning some of the basics of this. Because believe me, if you're doing rescue and you bring in a bird that looks fine, you know, you're bringing it into the sanctuary, it's not biting, it's not screaming, it looks normal, um, it looks like it has good behaviors, they unpack their behaviors after two or three weeks and you may be dealing with something you can't deal with. That's not good. If you have the skills to work with these guys, um, you won't be reaching your hand to put food in their cage and losing a finger. Yeah, you're not going to lose a finger, but you get the idea. 
Um, you don't want to get yourself in too deep. Now you've got a bird in a cage that, that the feed bowls are inaccessible, they're hard to get to, that doesn't want your hand in the cage, and you don't have the skills to work with it. So you want to get those skills. And if all of this seems like, oh, I just, I have to do all of this, you don't have to. Uh, it's not any, there's no law uh, other than, you know, filing with the IRS, things you have to do there. No law that says you have to know all this stuff, but if you don't, you could find yourself in a situation that's really hard to live with. Imagine having a bird that just screams all day long, like Bob, he used to scream all day long. Um, when I first brought him, he was just rah, 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 and he's loud, and uh, I was able to... To, to, to replace that behavior. He gets what he wants, which was attention, um, and I was able to replace the behavior so that he doesn't scream all day long. He will occasionally do some screaming, not squawking. Squawking is when they're just like, in the morning or at night when the sun comes up, the sun goes down, they squawk for a while. No, this is just repetitive, like, ah, ah, ah. So, so you want to cover those bases. You need to know the business side and understand how to run a business. You need to know how to, the, the behavior, the physiology, and the biology of these birds, and how their bodies work and how their minds work. That's important. You also need to know about, you need to know how to file for grants and try to get money from corporations. You're gonna find it's difficult to do that with a bird rescue. And the reason is, most corporations uh, or grantors that give money to, to rescues don't understand about parrots, okay? If we were rehoming raccoons, they would understand. They wouldn't expect you to be placing raccoons into people's homes. It wouldn't be expected, so they wouldn't expect a high turnover. Because you're taking a wild animal and shoving it in someone's home, that doesn't sound right. So you're going to get money from people who are, are uh, organizations that are specifically targeting helping wildlife, getting them to recover. If they're imprinted and they can't go back in the wild, just taking care of them. Okay, That's what you do with wild animals. But they don't realize that these guys are wild animals. I mean, ask any biologist who studies parrots, they'll say, well, they're wild animals. Actually, they'll say they're dinosaurs, because they are. They are dinosaurs. I actually heard uh, Dr. Novella saying that today on uh, The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. He said, well, they are dinosaurs. Um, and of course they are. So um, so you, if, you, if you're if you applying for grants, you'll notice that on almost all of these, these applications, then it says that you need to list how many you, how many birds you rehomed last year? Why would they want to know that? Now, can you imagine if it said, how many re raccoons did you place in, in homes with, you know, how many pet raccoons did you place in homes? That would sound strange. You know, most people would say, don't put raccoons into people's homes. Well, these guys are t maybe tame, but they're wild animals, right, Salamander? Yeah, yeah, you agree, don't you? Yeah, I knew you would. Bob, putting your two cents in. So you might be able to get a little grant money from the Petco Foundation for the first year or two, um, and I would suggest you what you would go. You should go ahead and try that, but don't expect any more. Um, it really, it's highly unlikely that Petco is going to give you money after that. They're focused on the rehoming, like most of them are. Um, I wouldn't bother with the ASPCA. They give, I think they had $20,000, somewhere in that range. I can't remember how much. But some tiny amount that they give to bird sanctuaries for the entire year. And they actually told me not to, you know, I could try, but there wasn't much money there. So you can go to something like Grant Station. Now, here, now here's one big clue for you. If you go out to techsoup.org, you can get a lot of freebies, a lot of computer-related freebies, uh, or very they're very low-priced items. What happens is they get these things donated to them for us, and then you pay an administrative fee. 
programs that you can use to make flyers and create artwork and that kind of thing. Uh, you know, includes uh, Photoshop and so. So if you go to TechSoup, you can get a lot of software um, that you normally would have to pay a ton of money for. Um, donation so management software where you can manage donors who are giving you money. Um, keep track of of where the money's coming from and the people who are supporting you. Donor Perfect uh, and other such software is available at a hugely discounted price. And a lot of that's online too, so you don't even have to install it. You can use their database online. It's all in the cloud. So you have all that uh, available through TechSoup to cover some of your expenses on setting up your business. You can get QuickBooks through there. You get your donor management software. And you want all that set up because when people start offering you money to help you get go forward, you want to be able to remember who they are and send them you know, thank you notes. Things if you need computers, they don't have any Apple computers, but if you are still one of the people using PCs, then uh, they do have laptops and and des desktops and tablets and things like that. Okay, so you've got the Nola Press book, you've done your, your standard score so you know what you're doing, you've got a background in biology and physiology and behavior, and maybe you've got one or two birds you're helping before you get everything really rolling, okay? So you've applied to the IRS and you're waiting for them to give you your, your determination letter, and you can roll on as if you're a nonprofit, you know, retain some of that money in the bank. And just in case they say no, you did something wrong, you can usually fix it. But if you did do something wrong and the IRS doesn't give you the acceptance letter, then you may end up having to pay taxes on what's coming in. So you need to fix that. And you also have donors and you have to let them know that We've applied, but we haven't been accepted yet. So you can donate to us, but we can't guarantee until we get our letter that this is tax deductible. You don't want to be doing something and have it appear like fraud. We got this money from people. We told them they could take it from their, you know, deduct it from their taxes, and they couldn't. So, so now you're at the point where you're going to start bringing in birds. Well, <clears throat> a number of things to keep in mind. Every bird that comes in has to go through quarantine. And they have to be tested. There are tests for psittacosis, for PVD now. We now have a decent test for proventricular dilation disease, PDD. And beak and feather disease with some. And you need to, we do have videos on those diseases. Uh, we have our veterinary series. You should look at that. Because if you have a bird come in that has PDD and it infects the other birds, they're going to die horribly. There's no cure for that disease. So you need to, you need to test them for these diseases, psittacosis, PDD, beak and feather, um, as they're brought in. And you need to know what species are affected. For example, you could have a lovebird. You think, well, it's just a little lover bird. I'll bring it in. Lovebirds can carry beak and feather. They could have psittacosis. So you could infect your whole group. So they have to be put into at least a 60-day quarantine away from the other birds and if, if it's on the premises then you got to scrub yourself down every time you're done with that area so you're going to do all your cleaning and feeding and stuff at one time for that bird during the day unless you've got multiple people who can do this and they're okay with getting cleaned up the first veterinary exam is generally 300 bucks and around that price <clears throat> and the reason for that is that they got to take blood, they got to do a full CBC, send it out to the lab for determinations. They have to run the DNA tests to see if they have you know, beacon feather or psittacosis or any of these other diseases. They got to test for all that. Most of vets will generally have a package deal for the new bird, okay? And you may be able to negotiate with the vet if you're starting a. Uh, a nonprofit um, for lower prices if you're going to be doing uh, rescue, especially where you're rescuing birds and then rehoming them. So, and that brings up the fact that to do the quarantine and all this, you obviously have to find a decent avian vet. So, you're going to have to go out and talk to these avian vets. Um, 
and find out what their qualifications are and see if they're the kind of vet that can work with you. Um, it's important and you need, if possible, you should have more than one avian vet and you should consider a avian vets that also have the 24 hour service because <laughs> I swear if, when a bird, most birds, it seems like develop a problem on Saturday afternoon, you know, when these vets have shut down for the weekend and you have nowhere to go. We have two in San Diego County. Uh, one I will always use, which is Dr. Jenkins, but I'm probably not going to see him unless it's something really that only he can handle. I will see another vet that he has authorized and they talk to him over the phone or they talk to his uh, associate and that's how they deal with the situation. So there is another one where they actually have vets on hand all weekend but it's not a place I normally would go. It's not because it's farther away, which it is, but I just don't have the same confidence as I do with Dr. Jenkins. So, so you've got to have the vets lined up. It's not something you can think about afterwards. You need to have vets up front. You may bring a bird home and think, well, you know, I can really help this bird and, you know, the bird's got psychological problems or whatever and I'm just going to do this and get it home and then 20 minutes later it's ripped out some of its feathers and it's bleeding down the side of its body. Now as far as setting up a sanctuary and this book is great for people who don't eat, they're not even planning to have a sanctuary. It has so much information in it that you can use. It's the shelter manual from the avianwelfare.org. It's $25 and it's packed with information for, for starting up a sanctuary. On top, it has the forms you need for relinquishment, for adoption, um, the waiver you need, because you, people have got to sign, sign a waiver if they're going to handle these birds. You don't want somebody suing you um, because you didn't have them sign a waiver before they ha <coughs> handle a bird and then they got bit. So, that's a great resource. The other resources you're going to need, uh, the Manual for Parrot Behavior, uh, excuse me, the Manual of Parrot Behavior by Lucia. That has everything you, probably everything you'll need to know about behavior in it. Um, from youth all the way up through old age. You know, uh, all the psychological issues and the reasons for them. And I love you too, Roman Berry. And then the Basaba Manual for Citizen Birds. It's great to have. <coughs> it's the only manual I know of that covers just specifically parrots. Um, clinical avian medicine is a good one too, um, but it covers all birds. So there's a lot of stuff in there that won't be relevant um, because you're not working on cranes um, and you're not working on ostriches. So we're not working with ratites. I have that digital. Uh, both of those books are available digital, so you can have them on your phone, on your computer, and, and uh, you can search them a lot faster that way. Um, I'll get people online that will talk about a problem they have, and I'll be able to look quickly and find out, hey, um, that discoloration on your parrot's feathers, that's probably yeast, and that's due to a problem with the liver, and go see your avian vet right now, and, and that's exactly what it is, because she just looked it up in the Basaba manual. So you'll have to have the, f the forms that you need. You're also going to need forms for volunteers. Um, volunteer Match is a great place online. You don't have to pay anything. They have a free service. Uh, they do have a pay-for service as well, but you, a free service within whatever your radius is. And you can find volunteers that way, and that's helpful. So once you have all your forms together, your volunteer uh, sign-up forms, your um, relinquishment adoption forms, your quality of life, um, all of that stuff. The quality of life form is in the manual of parrot behavior. So there's a lot of forms in there too. <clears throat> so now you've got your, now you have a good basis to get started. So you, you set up your quarantine area. You have a vet to take the birds to, 
to make sure that they get tested and, and they're clean. Um, you got to plan out where you're going to put everything. And we try to keep cages away from open windows. They want We want to get them where they feel comfortable. There's a wall that blocks one side. Sometimes in sanctuary situations, you end up where you have to put cages down the middle. We're limited in our space, and we don't have cages in the middle. They're all at least on a wall. So the birds feel more comfortable when they know that there aren't predators coming from all sides. They have at least some areas that are safe. The birds that are the most nervous, you want to get them in the corner in a cage. Not a corner cage, but in the corner because they got two sides they're protected on to help them feel more confident. <clears throat> the books say, and it's what we do, but some people want to bring in more birds so they don't do this, but we have night cages and day cages. Um, once I take all the birds from the day area, and they've done playing, they're out of the cages in the front area too, they go in the into the night area, they go into those cages, and then you clean the other area. So it does make it easy as far as cleaning too, plus the birds are, you always know they're gonna move from one to the other. They're, they're never gonna be stuck in a cage at all the time, because sometimes you get busy. So the other reason is that if, they, if they're in a large cage and they get scared, they have a night fright, they fall down through the perches and they hit the bottom of the cage and their wing gets stuck, they could break their wing. The smaller cages make that less likely that they're going to hurt themselves. Um, and it's best to, you can either put like a few foot toys in there if you want them to have toys, but you don't have to hang any toys in the night cages. That's, that's for the day cages. Get your medical kits together. Before you start bringing in birds, you need to have super clot and you need to have some good scissors to cut bandaging you need to have plenty of bandages for uh, volunteers and <laughs> that's the main reason you have bandages um, you're going to need some basics that your vet may give you like sylvadine or vetrocin things to, to put on you. wounds um, if you've got a bird that mutilates its chest and sylvadine is probably the best thing for it it's a cream that can be put on there then you can put some kind of cover over it, like a sock over the bird. Um, if you've got a wound like a, a, a foot that's been bitten by another bird, you can spray vetrocin on it. It's a clear liquid that you spray on. That's an excellent thing to, to spray on wounds like that. It doesn't seem to affect their skin. Super clot's another thing. Um, if a bird's bleeding and they have a wound, not if this doesn't generally work with broken blood feathers, but not only does it stop the bleeding, but it also has a disinfectant and uh, a painkiller. You need to have that kit ready. And then the kit for people as well. Um, and your best bet is to have everything that OSHA wants in one of those kits for, for your volunteers. You should start working for a support base from the moment you get your, your 501c3 paperwork into the IRS. Have your web page. Um, set up a GoFundMe to try to get the money to do this. Um, tell them, you know, the, we're starting a, a rescue or shelter for parrots. Um, put your mission statement in there. The other thing I failed to mention, um, you need a a business, you'll get this from SCORE, but you need to have a business plan. It's really a business. It's a nonprofit. It's a charity, but it's still a business. So you need to do make up a business plan. Um, there are sources online for that. And I'll try to link to those for you. Um, but you need to do that, and SCORE will help you too if you take one of their classes. Um, so in your business plan, you'll have a, a mission statement. 
And that's something that you'll use with your GoFundMe, say, well, we are so-and-so, and our purpose is to do this, and we're looking for money, you know, we're looking for funding in order to do this, and this, and this, and so could you please help us out, et cetera, et cetera. Um, other sources of funding, um, advertising, just to get the word out about who you are. Google has their, their Google for nonprofits. It's free. You get advertising. It's strict how it's set up. It's hard to do to fill out the paperwork and get it right. They'll let you keep trying and trying and trying until you get it right. But once you're in, there's a lot of things that can help you with. You can do advertising on your webpage through Google Ads. There's little ways you can bring in a, a bit of money here and there. You can create videos and put them up on YouTube and and ask for money. If you're if you're in the Google for nonprofits program, you can put a little deal that pops up on your video so they can click it and donate. But look at the funding because I'll tell you when I when I was starting this up, I went up to uh, the Lily Sanctuary and they're great people, Dan and Vanetta, and uh, told them what I wanted to do, and I said. I try to find a way to make you know make this pay for itself, you know, so I can build it and make it bigger. And they didn't laugh at me, but their eyes were laughing, and they're looking at me like, "You're going to, you're going to get enough money from this to keep it going." In my mind, it was like they were laughing at me because I was so naive. And I'll tell you, it it's really difficult to get support because people don't understand birds. And the people who do have birds, it's an expensive and time-consuming project, so they may want to help you, but they may not have any funds to give you. You know, they're spending all their time and effort just trying to work with the one or two birds they have, and, and you know, they, they really don't have much extra. So, you've got to work out your funding. That's really important. Um, and for the first year or two using GrantStation, you can apply for grants and you'll probably get some the first couple of years. Don't plan on it after that. Not unless you're, you're bringing in you know, 100 birds a year and rehoming 100 birds a year. Um, and if you're doing that, you're probably not helping those birds much. So you got your funding. Now, here's the thing. Where can you cut corners? One of the things is when we started, we were going through about two packages of, of paper towels from Costco, and that's one way to cut corners. Buy what you can from Costco. When you can buy organic frozen vegetables at a dollar a pound, and you're buying a five pound bag, it's a little more than a dollar a pound now, but about a little over a dollar a pound for frozen vegetables that you can make mash with. Um, That beats the heck out of the prices in the supermarket where they give you a 12 ounce bag for $2.30. You know, that's just, it's insane what you have to pay in the supermarket. Um, other things you use with birds, we use oats. We buy our oats there. I pay $8 for this huge thing of Quaker oats. And it's part of their mash. So, you know, it lasts, a, lasts us a month and a half, one box like that. Is they get a certain amount in their mash every day. It's good fiber and adds liquid to their poop so that they don't get, it helps to keep them from getting uh, a cloacal prolapse, right? Do you agree, Salamander? Do you agree, Salamander? You do? You really do? Well, that's a good boy. Okay. So one way to cut, it, to cut uh, corners at uh, Costco, we bought... My hi Chloe. We bought microfiber towels and also cotton towels, the kind they use in like cleaning cleaning organizations use. So if you're wiping up, and I don't use them for poop, but if you're wiping up spilled food or just wiping off the counters and that kind of thing, those work great. And you can just toss them into a bin outside and then you know when it gets close to full, you can go ahead and wash them and Try them and use them again. And that we went from buying two bags of paper towels every month to one. <coughs> and considering the paper towels are $15 for a bag and, and the cloth towels were $10 for 30 cloth towels, 
that you get to keep using over and over again, you know, that makes a big difference. Um, it's okay. great for, I keep one for wiping my hands off while I'm cleaning in the kitchen. Another thing you need is some trays, some mobile trays that you can move around, that you can put food bowls on so you can get those, you know, it helps you to unload food bowls from the cages and put them back. Multiple trays, Harbor Freight has these things, okay? You got a tray on top, another tray, and then a tray below, and you know, wheels, you can wheel it around. So that gives you a place to put a newspaper to put in the bottom of the cages, which is what you should use, newspaper. And then it gives you a place to get all their bowls, you pull their water and their food out, so you can wash it, and also to load it back in. Those carts will save you a lot of steps, and the save steps will save you a lot of work. Um, a good plan, too. Like in the morning, uh, you'll see that in our uh, day um, a video we have that, sh that shows uh, a day in the life. <coughs> we have a plan for how they come out of the cage. They come out of the cage, they sit on the perch, they're given any medicine they have, they're sprayed down, they're fed. Um, you know, the whole day, there's a certain set plan. It varies. A does vary some, but having a plan in place and knowing what birds come out in what order. This bird, for example, has to come out first, right, Salamander? If he doesn't come out of his cage first, he gets upset. Well, I'm guessing he's upset because he doesn't want to come out of his cage then. And he will argue with you about it, won't you? Oh, yes, you do. Oh, tell him you're, all, you're so sweet you would never argue with me, right? Oh, no, I would never argue with him. Right? Yeah. So there's a certain order. So have, and you know the IRS also wants you to write um, basically a scenario. This is what your day is going to be like. This is how the day is going to run. They want to know that you have some idea how you're going to run a business. So you'll need to do that for the IRS anyway. So that'll be part of your filing with the IRS, writing up a typical day. And then you have to keep records, and you can get FileMaker if you have an Apple. There are other programs, databases, like um, Microsoft has one. It slipped my mind. I haven't used it in so long, and I hated it. But um, you need some kind of a database to keep your birds in. There is, um, there is a free one, and I'll put a link to it. Um, there's a free one you can use. Which is a which is a full database that's used by by rescues to record the animals that come in and go out. But you'll need that. You'll need, you'll need some way to file and keep information on them, even if you're going to be a sanctuary that doesn't uh, do rehoming. Um, you still need to have a record of what's going on with each one. It's medical record, behavioral record. Yeah, like when you came here, you were a cute cruise missile, weren't you? You were a cruise missile bird. Yes, you were. Yes, you were. Why was that? Oh, it's what you wanted to be was a cruise missile? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, we've been just chattering about all this technical stuff. So, like, cleaning is a big thing. You've got to know how to... If you get a cage in that's donated, you have to use special stuff to clean it. I'll put... I'll pop something on the screen that tells you about this particular product that gets rid of viruses so that you are sure that are relatively sure that your cage is safe to put a bird into. So you get donations. Uh, there's another thing too. If you get a cage donated and somebody wants you, you get you get an item like a cage donated and they want you to give them a, a receipt uh, for a donation, you have to leave the donation amount blank. This is something it took me for a while to find out. So in letting you know that you can't put down what you think the value of the product is. So if they donate a cage, you put down, they donated a cage, and you make a note that the don donor will list the amount. So that way if the IRS comes back, they say, well, they won't say, why did you put down $200 for this cage? Well, you don't have the qualifications to put that in. So they can fill it in, 
what they paid for it or what they think the cage is worth, worth and then they can deal with the IRS if the IRS has an issue with it. If you're going to get a place, there goes Bob. Uh, Bob, Bob. Are you okay? Let me see. Did it come out okay? All right. Um, if, you're going to, if you're specifically going to get a place, you have to think about the kind of floors. Probably linoleum is the best. Um, but if you're going to be renting and you're rolling things across the linoleum, it, it'll get scraped and marked. And so you probably, if it's better if, you're, if it's your own property. Um, uh -huh. Linoleum is the best. Uh, tile's okay, but you will be dropping things occasionally. And some of them may be heavy. Um, the location is important. It needs to be, uh, you need a, an, at least an acre around you if possible, um, some space between you and the, the homes that are around you, because these guys are just a little noisy. So when I come back to the sanctuary, they all go off, and you're going to find that's going to be true in, in most sanctuary situations. So keep that in mind. Um, Also, the insulation on the building is important. The one we're in it doesn't really have any. It was built back in 55. There's no insulation, so it's a lot of money to run the air and the heat every year. Um, the, our last bill was $411 to run the heat here because we've had a cold month. I know, we're in San Diego. We're not supposed to get cold, but it hasn't broken 70 in at least two weeks. And it's been getting down into the 30s at night. So... You know, and the heat that we do heat up a room goes right out the wall. So look at the and make sure it has some decent insulation. Um, you can't use gas. So if you've got like a wall furnace, you can't use it. If it's outside central heating, then it'll be okay because the vents are outside. You shouldn't have a problem with that. Um, I don't I don't know of a problem with that. You don't want to use a uh, like a forced air gas heater inside the building though. There's one in this building, we don't use it. Um, you need an evacuation plan. I mean, there's so many little things you need, but you do need to have an evacuation plan. You want to check with the city and see if you're going to have permission. They'll give you permission. What it'll take if you want to put outside aviaries in. Um, if you want to do that, keep in mind that like, and home aviaries, you have to do something about the ground, too. Because animals can dig up underneath and get in. You need to put some kind of wire in the ground or have a slab there uh, for the aviary so that that can't happen. And it's best to have double mesh above so that hawks and hawks can't get down to your birds. You're going you're gonna to be generating a lot of trash, so you're probably going to need extra trash Hands and you have to find out how much that's going to cost you. Um, then probably once a year you're going to need a dumpster to get rid of junk that builds up. You're going to need extra um, recyclable bins. One source that you'll find that you use quite a bit is Amazon because let's say if you need a heater or a fan or something like that and you're on Amazon Prime you can get it in two days. So, or you realize that, oh boy, I need papaya, I didn't order enough, you can have it in two days. You can order it on Friday and deliver it on Sunday, that's kind of nice. Um, you won't have as much time to just run out, oh, I'll just take a little run to the store to get this. It's not usually that easy. You're probably going to find the molding disappears quite quickly around the doors. Uh, the doors can also disappear. The birds will chew through them if they're out. So um, one way to deal with that is to put like two by fours up instead of instead of uh, molding around the doors. And if they decide to choose the two by four, yeah, they decide to chew the two by fours. It's no big deal. 
you need to figure out your your purchasing methodology where you're gonna buy um, you have to consider price and delivery time and you're not going over there Bob come here price and delivery time quality all those are important so Amazon is a great source for a lot of what you need um, you may find specific things we use Foster and Smith to get our, our 25 pound bags of, of Rowdy Bush. They don't charge freight for, for anything over $49. And that's how much a bag of their of that food is. So 25 pounds in freight is quite a bit. Toy Parts. Um, BirdToyParts.com has, if you are a 501c3, you can apply and can buy parts there. Uh, considering the average toy is for a bird this size is around $15 and I can make them for $1.50 and much better than the ones they have for $15 and you reuse the chain, reuse the most of the plastic parts. Bob now, oh, oh he got into your spot and you don't like that? I'm sorry. Bob, Bob hold on. Salamander come here. You're in Bob's spot. Bob, 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 be nice. It's okay. I got him out of your spot. I'm sorry. You want to play with something? Um. <clears throat> hmm. Excuse me, salamander. You want to play with that? You can play with that right there. There you go. Now he's no, he's in his own spot. You don't need to do that. He's not bugging you. He's playing with something there. Peaches, what are you doing? So you're basically going to buy a chain, and we have a whole video on that, so I won't go through it. But because you're going to find that you don't have enough time to do everything. You're going to need all the help you can get. And if you can't get help, you have to still be able to do it. So don't push yourself to the point where if your volunteers didn't show up one day, you couldn't handle it. Don't stretch yourself too thin. And don't count 100% on your volunteers. That's another important thing. Most importantly about all this is that if you understand how to run a business, you know what the rules are from the IRS and the state as far as maintaining your, your nonprofit status, you have an idea and you have a plan for the business, you have ideas and are working on funding, you have a presence on social media and a website, you have veterinarians that are that are aware of you and you are comfortable with them working on the birds and you know what the prices of things are going to cost for the most part you have all the forms you need and all the reference materials you you need you have the the backing from some supporters and people to form your board of directors you have a place to house the birds cages to house them in that includes travel cages for emergencies a night cages and day cages you know your sources where your food has to come from where you're going to get your food your toy parts um, toys if you're buying some toys um, and the other incidentals like the stuff you get from Costco the paper towels the frozen vegetables the fresh vegetables and fruits so you know where you're going to get your stuff. You have your quarantines planned, your medical exams. If you're a rescue, you have your plan for checking out the homes to make sure that the, the, the people who are going to be adopting a bird are good. Um, the Lily Sanctuary is a good place to look at pricing for bird for adoption or the fees for adoption. If you, if you have all these things in place, you have a good basis to start a sanctuary.
most people who do this get that kind of information a little late. They learn it the hard way. And let me tell you, you don't want to learn about like, the financial side of it the hard way. You want to start working on that from the very beginning. It's much easier to save birds. You're getting a little frisky there, guy. It's much easier to save birds if you have money than it is to be trying to work with birds and help them through problems they have while you're beating your head against the wall trying to figure where your next dollar is coming from. And uh, after a while, you kind of get either a flat head or a lot of headaches. We need more people doing this. It's really rewarding. Um, when you see a bird like this, he used to be a cruise missile, and now he's just a big love bug. Well, he's still got issues, but I know what they are, and we deal with them, don't we, kid? This guy here, who was rehomed eight times, and absolutely just didn't know anyone loved him. Yeah. It's, it's, it's quite rewarding. Get, get a good basis first. Don't do what I did. Don't rush into it without trying to... I mean, I tried to learn everything, but I rushed in and got birds first. And it's a good idea to get your basis before you start loading yourself with a whole bunch of birds and realizing you have a financial burden that's hard to deal with. But I hope that some of you are planning to do this, and, you know, you can always... You can always email me and ask questions. I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can if you're planning on this and, uh, and help you with uh, what I can to help you get started. So it's really rewarding. Have a room full of birds that used to be psychotic and tearing their feathers out and, and unhappy and like Babalu who are happy. You feel like you really did something with your life then. Who wants to say goodbye? Peaches, you want to say goodbye? Bob, why don't you say goodbye this time? Come on, Bob. Bob, come here, sweetheart. Oh, baby, I know, I know he's doing that. Come on, hold on. Bob, Bob, it's all right. Okay, here we go. Bob, say goodbye to the people. Bob, say goodbye. Yay! See you guys next time. We welcome your feedback on our videos. We look forward to your insights, tips, questions, stories, and pictures. You can email us at cockatude at chloesanctuary.org, reach us on Twitter at sign Chloe Sanctuary, and join with us on our Facebook Chloe Sanctuary page. So science Knowledge only adds to the excitement, the mystery, and the awe of a flower.